Hello, everyone. Come on in. If you're coming in, please come take a seat. Maybe I should invite our speakers to come sit up front. Um, I feel a bit like an alien with this contraption I have on. I think we have a different AV setup than usual, so I'm looking forward to taking this off. Um, so let me welcome you all here. Let me wish you a very happy new year. Hopefully this is the last time I have to say that. Hopefully it's the last time you have to hear it until next January or so. Um, but it's a real pleasure to welcome you to our first speaker series event for 2019. Um, many of you are familiar with our speaker series event. Uh, for those of you who are not, um, it is a, a series featuring talks by distinguished scholars and policymakers, all with the goal of, of fostering discussion about both successes and challenges in global poverty alleviation and development. And tonight we couldn't be more excited to have uh, Michael Kramer joining us for what I think will be a very engaging discussion on you can see the title on funding innovations in development, scaling, and impact. Uh, very briefly about Michael, he is the Gates Professor of Developing Societies uh, in the Department of Economics at Harvard. Um, his recent work examines, his recent work is hard to keep up with, but it examines uh, education, health, water, and agriculture in developing countries. Um, there are many things we could say to brag about Michael to keep it short. I'll tell you he's a fellow uh, of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship uh, Genius Grant. Uh, he has also received a Presidential Faculty Fellowship and the World Economic Forum has named him a, a young global leader. Um, something I'd really like to highlight though about Michael is that he's been very impactful in the real world, not just in academics. Um, he, for example, he has helped to develop uh, advanced market commitments for vaccines to stimulate private investment in vaccine research and distribution in low-income countries. Um, in the fall of 2010, he also became the founding scientific director of development innovation ventures at USAID. Um, he received all of his schooling from Harvard, so I think we could just leave it at that and not comment more. Um, before we welcome Michael to the stage, I also want to quickly introduce to you Nick Bloom, uh, who will be moderating a, dis a discussion uh, with Michael tonight. Um, Nick is the William uh, Eberl Professor of Economics here at Stanford. He's a senior fellow here at CEPR. He's also co-director of the Productivity Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program at NBER, the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, his research focuses on management practices and uncertainty. Um, he has previously worked um, outside of academics. He worked in, the, in Treasury in the UK. He worked for McKinsey. Um, he's also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he received all of his schooling in the UK, Cambridge, Oxford, University College, London, all the schools you would probably guess there. Um, so please join me in welcoming our guest and first Michael for a wonderful talk this evening. Thank you very much for that. Um, let, me, uh, let me just uh, uh, begin by acknowledging uh, uh, some of my co-authors, uh, Sasha Gallant, who's at Evidence Action, uh, Olga Rostopshova at the University of Chicago, and Milan Thomas, who's actually here today. Um, uh, I should also uh, disclose, I guess I'm doing that here, um, I'm an academic, but I'm also a scientific director of Development Innovation Ventures, and I'll be talking about data from that. So you should, I guess I'm not, uh, not, in, in, not entirely unbiased on this. So there's been a, a, um, a lot of growth recently in international development of initiatives that are designed to invest in innovation for development, innovation specifically for developing countries. And there are different variants of that. There's a lot of scientific research for development. If you think about all the work the Gates Foundation has done on developing uh, uh, new drugs or new vaccines, specifically for the health problems of developing countries, or work they've done on agriculture. It's also a big movement of impact investing. Um, think about Omidyar or Skoll, or many universities have, have, uh, have efforts on that. And obviously, uh, Stanford is, is one of them. There's a... Um, there's also a big movement of 
RCTs, which I should translate, I should have gotten rid of that abbreviation, randomized controlled trials to look at social innovations. Um, and that's you know, been, been very important over the past 20 years, and a lot of it has been supported by development agencies, the World Bank, uh, uh, the British uh, um, aid agency, DFID. So I think that in, in terms of economic theory, there's a very strong rationale uh, for why it might make sense t for donors uh, and philanthropists and governments to invest in research and development. In, 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 uh, and that's that, that was outlined by uh, Paul Romer, who's, uh, who's a longtime uh, uh, researcher here, M most recently it's been uh, brought, um, which is that there's a, the benefits of, the, of, of innovation extend not just to whoever produces it, but to customers and to other companies really all over the world, um, or to other governments all over the world. And that means that there might not be sufficient incentives for, uh, for you'll get some innovation uh, without, without this, but there's a very strong economic rationale uh, for, for support for this. But I should emphasize that that's theory. The, ultimately, you have to ask, you know, is there a payoff to this investment in innovation? And you know, do the benefits exceed the costs if we try to quantify them? And Without that data, if this is just a theoretical argument, then there's reason for concern about this. It's a very hard task to try to empirically measure what the payoff to these innovation investments are. So, um, but what this paper is designed to do is to try to get at, to try and start to make a stab at that in one particular case, looking at the portfolio of, of development innovation ventures, the USAID program. Um, there's a lot of the, the you know, I'll go through the, the methodological approach, but let me just to say a little bit about this. There's not a whole lot of empirical uh, systematic analyses. What there often is is anecdotes. And the issue is those anecdotes come down on both sides. So there's cases like oral rehydration therapy, which uh, you know, saved countless lives. Um, but there's also cases like play pumps, uh, 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 the idea that you, you somebody developed this uh, idea that, of a... a merry-go-round type thing, kids would push it, they'd be playing, and they'd be pumping water at the same time. And, you know, lots of donors put a lot of money into this, and, you know, it was a disaster and it never took off. Um, it's hard work to pump water, and, you know, uh, it's, um, it's not what, you know, this particular form of child labor didn't, uh, didn't work out. Okay, so, um, okay. The second question that we'll try and get at is which innovations scale? And it's very related to the previous question, because the previous question is, do the benefits of this innovation investment exceed the costs? And the benefits are going to be, um, if to get substantial benefits, you typically need to reach substantial scale. Because the benefit is the number of people reached times the net benefit after accounting for costs of the people reached. So, uh, or sorry, per person reached. So the, the um, so, Getting a large number of people reached is, into, is, is, is a necessary condition, typically, but it's not going to be sufficient because you also have to think about the benefit per person. But if you're, not, if you're, if you're play pumps and you're reaching, you know, very few of these pumps are out there and are functioning, then there's very hard, hard to see how you're going to get substantial benefits. And unfortunately, there's a lot of concern in the impact investing world about are things really scaling? And in fact, you know, in the uh, randomized control world, there's lots of examples of, you know, RCTs were done, and then it's not clear whether people really paid attention to them or whether they affected policy. Um, so, you know, there's there's um, there's concern about this, and the so trying to if we could predict which innovations were going to scale, we could much better orient our innovation investments, or at least that's a one important factor. Now, there's a few analyses of scaling out there, but what they tend to do is they tend to cherry pick the successful innovations and then analyze them in an ex post way. And then, so for example, a typical conclusion is, you know, it's very important to understand the customer. And I agree with that, but it's also very subjective whether you've, the team or the management team is very important. That's a very subjective uh, assessment. And obviously if the thing scaled and was super successful, then you're likely to conclude, well, they really understood their customer and they had a great management team. You know, the question, you know, you have to ask, can you, are there factors that you can predict at the time you're making the investment and can objectively measure? So we'll try to move towards that. And we'll also not just look at the successes, we'll try to look at the 
fraction of successes, you know, the number of successes divided by the total number of investments made. A very, you know, uh, I think of this paper as trying to improve the rigor half a step. You know, there's a lot fancier things you can do, but putting in a denominator of how many total investments you made seems like a, a first step. Okay, so the, the, just to give a, a sense of where we're going. I'm going to give a little bit of background on the, the, the organization for, uh, for which we're looking at the portfolio, Development Innovation Ventures at, at USAID, and just describe the process that was used at the time. We're going to focus on the early portfolio because one of the big findings in, in analysis of innovation is it often takes a long time for innovations to scale. They have to iterate. They have to be refined. That can be a process of you know, multiple decades. And in this case, we don't have multiple you know, we won't be looking multiple decades ago, but we'll be looking at the, you have to, you, you can't look at to the innovation scale after a year. Uh, if you're Google or Facebook, maybe you can, but, but not typically. Okay. Um, so then we'll talk about the, the methodology that we use to try to assess do the benefits exceed the cost. And I think that's one that, although we'll apply it to this case, I hope it's one that could be used in other contexts as well. Then we'll do the application to the DIV portfolio, try to calculate um, uh, whether the benefits exceeded the costs, and then uh, move into predictors of which innovation scale, sort of looking within the portfolio. And I should say that this is work that um, builds on work that was done with Astro Duflo, that last, uh, that last section. So background on USAID's development innovation ventures. So it's, in some ways, it's similar to a lot of the uh, efforts to invest in innovation for development, but it also has some important... Uh, uh, characteristics which I think are distinctive. So it's open, so it's open across sectors. So you often have very focused funds. Uh, donors often support something, well, we're working on malaria, or we're working on a uh, you know, particular type of medical device or, or a particular area on solar energy. This was open across sectors. It's also open across scaling methods. So there are some, there are, take impact investing, that's typically looking for things that are going to scale commercially. We were open to things that are would scale commercially, but we're also open to things that would scale, for example, through governments, through adoption by developing country governments, and in fact, to other, other possible scaling routes. And I think one of the interesting findings is that we found that things scaled through much more complicated uh, routes than, than one might have uh, anticipated up front. We're tiered. So if you, um, the tiering is we had three different investment stages. So the, the first one was for piloting. And during the period under consideration, that was just up to $100,000. So very early stage things. The second stage was testing. And that was either a rigorous test of impact and cost effectiveness, typically with a randomized controlled trial, but didn't have to be, um, or a market test. And the market test was intended to be not just is there some demand for this, but can, is, can you actually cover the costs of, and make this commercially viable? So those, those could be grants of up to a million dollars. And then for things that had passed those, that second stage of, uh, of a test, then we would provide funds of up to $15 million. And that's for transitioning to scale. So when that when we talk about this being an evidence-based, uh, a tiered evidence-based investment fund, the idea was we'll support things at an early stage without rigorous evidence. But to get the very large amounts of money, you had to have that rigorous evidence. Now, we, the rigorous evidence of, say, impact and cost effectiveness wasn't enough. We wanted to think beyond that. Did this have the potential for scale? But we didn't assess that with sort of a checklist approach, which is, for those of you who work in the field, there are a lot of funders who have a, you know, a checklist approach of, of various sorts. We focused mostly on we didn't say you have to have funders lined up, you had to have a government lined up to say, we will do this if you find positive results. We focused mainly on, was this something that was cheap enough to potentially scale? And was it something that was obviously a political non-starter? And if it was a political non-starter, then we were, and if it was supposed to scale through governments, we were less enthusiastic. In terms of the, we were also differed, I, I would argue, in the, um, in the processes we focused a lot on peer review, which obviously people in the research community are very used to, um, and is thought to be very important and is used by funders like the National Science Foundation. But it's very different than the process used by a lot of, say, foundations, um, where there's 
where a lot is decided by the staff in the organization. And I think a lot of these elements are actually compl very complementary with each other in the sense that they go together naturally. So if you're going to be open across sectors, then you're never going to have the expertise internally to judge you know, agriculture and, and uh, solar energy. If you want, but the way, the, so that's why we adopt, one of the reasons why we adopted this peer review approach, which is we had to have people associated with, the, with uh, DIV who could, who could identify the experts in those fields and then send off the proposal to them. Um, we also had a lot of engagement with the development economics uh, research community. Here's another way in which we differed from some funders. There's some, there are some uh, funders, you know, this applies to the private venture capital world as well. Some think of themselves as, you know, we're putting in the money and that's what we do. But many venture capitalists think, and um, you know, we're trying to add a lot of value beyond just the money. And the same thing with development uh, innovation funders. Um, you know, some of the foundations that do this or, or government programs that do this try to add a lot of value beyond the money. We weren't a, it wasn't that we made a conscious decision on this one way or the other, but at the time when we started, we had extremely limited staff and we had extremely, um, we were under government procurement rules that made it very hard to have a big role in that. So we basically were just supplying the money, uh, judging the proposals and supplying the money rather than trying to really shape the, uh, co-create or shape the, um, the, 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 um, the, the proposal, or go out and actively solicit individual proposals. OK, so that's background on the, on, the, on the government program that we're looking at. Let me talk, say a bit about the methodology. So the basic idea is we want to look at the benefit-cost ratio. Uh, and you can think about that at the individual innovation level, or you can think about that at the portfolio level. Um, the form, you know, there's some a formula here, but it's, it's very simple, which is you, you, the, 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 the top, the numerator of this is the benefits, the denominator is the cost, and we're just looking at the ratio of the benefits to the cost. How do you get the benefits? Well, you multiply N, the number of users reached, times B, the net uh, benefit per user after subtracting operating costs. So if, if somebody's, if it's a cook stove and um, you know, the customer pays something for the cook stove. You want the benefits minus the, the amount they paid. Um, and then one thing that we tried to do, again, trying to m you know, move slightly towards, uh, uh, slightly, you know, uh, towards something more rigorous and away from uh, um, the approach often taken by a lot of donors is we didn't want to count all the, if, often DIV was one of several funders. We don't want to count all of the benefits, but only the costs that we put in. So we only count the share of the benefits that correspond to the share of the costs that, we, that were covered. Okay. Um, and one advantage of this approach is we're not measuring, you know, this would, this, if you add this up across funders, you would get the overall return to innovation investment. Um, okay. the, um, so we'll mostly focus on the benefit cost ratio. You can also calculate the social rate of return. And the, uh, and the social rate of for the benefit cost ratio, we'll take the discount rate, R, um, as, as given, so we'll use a 10% discount rate. An alternative, uh, so think of a 10% cost of capital. An alternative approach would be to say, what, was, what would be, the, uh, what would be the, the rate of return that would cause the benefits to equal the cost? And that's the social rate of return. Okay, so that's the individual program. For an individual innovation, you might hope to calculate that. For the portfolio level, um, we just had to have to add that up over all the innovations in the, add up the benefits over all the innovations in the portfolio, divide by all the costs of the portfolio, both the portfolio costs, the, the grants that went out, but also the cost of salaries and so on. Okay. Um, okay. Now, that's the theory. It's very difficult to do this in practice. Um, there are some cases it's just almost impossible to do because we, among the, if it's an agriculture project, you can measure the extra yields. Or if it's a health project, you can measure the health gain and try and convert that to um, uh, the ex each year of life to some dollar metric. I mean, there's lots of issues with it, but you know, there's procedures for that. But some of these things were things to try to reduce voter fraud. We know, you know we have evidence on whether it reduced voter fraud. How do you put a dollar value on it? You know, we're not even going to try here. Um, there's also cases where there's where conceptually you might be able to do this, but you don't know how much the, how much the health benefit was or how much the 
um, the agricultural benefit was. Um, and then this other issue, which is uh, some things might eventually scale, but they're just not there yet. You could project into the future, but we didn't want to get into that sort of very subjective uh, thing. So what we've so how do we deal with these difficulties? The basic idea is we're trying to take uh, is a bounding approach. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the cost of the entire portfolio, all 43 things that were supported over this period, and set that against the benefits just of a subset, and not the benefits projected into the future, but the benefits that have already been realized. So this is going to be, we hope that the eventual rate of return will be much bigger than what we'll get here. But we're going to be very conservative in calculating this. And you might think, you know, how are you going to ever answer the question if you're just only looking at a subset of the benefits from a subset and the cost, and it's not a big subset, and the cost for everything? Well, the reason why this is, is even feasible is, sorry, I will, let me, I, I'm going to, let me skip over this. Um, the reason why this is even feasible is because if you're funding innovation, it's not that you're going to, I mentioned there's anecdotes of success, anecdotes of failure. That's not super informative. Even the count of, you know, we had more failures than, than benefits, or some failures than successes, that's not super informative. And the reason is that the distribution of impact is extremely skewed. And of course, the same thing is true in other types of investment and innovation. This would be true for a private venture capital firm. You know, you invest in, in Google, you're doing fine, even if you had a lot of failures. So what you see here is uh, the distribution of the number of people reached um, for each innovation. And you know, there's, even, there's another 10 out there that we didn't even show because you know, we, we think it was very small and we don't have data. But you'll see this extremely skewed distribution. This is not of social benefits yet, um, but this is just, I just wanted to show the shape of this, which means that if we got data just on a few of these, we might be able to capture a significant share of the, of the total benefits. Now, it turns out, I'll explain this more later, that, and I don't know if you can see the colors back there, but we, we weren't able to get data on these three biggest ones. We were able to get data on four, five, and six, which I'll show you in a minute, and then um, you know, we don't have, have these ones. I hope we'll expand the set that we have. But we're going to be looking at the benefits of just these three innovations against the cost of the whole portfolio. A um, couple of the assumptions we'll make, I already mentioned, 10%, we, we assume a 10% cost of capital. We value a year of life saved at the GDP of the country. That's a World Health Organization threshold for, for highly cost-effective things. They actually prefer three GDPs per capita, but we're trying to be conservative. And our costs, there was $19 million of, investment, of grants that went out. Um, our, a rough estimate of our admin costs is about $2 million. So that's, that's very rough um, for reasons I'm happy to discuss. Okay, so how do we calculate the benefits of these of innovation? So let me go through the three that we've so far met, managed to include. Okay. So this, first we're trying to think about the costs. So the cost, this was a $215,000 investment uh, to, uh, um, and the, this was actually to a group at Georgetown University, uh, Javier Riman uh, and Jack. Um, their, what was the innovation they came up with? It was pretty crazy sounding. Um, there are, for those of you who spend time in developing countries, you'll see a lot of private minibuses that drive like crazy, overcrowded, you know, disasters. And there's, they, you know, in, in Kenya, I work in Kenya, so familiar, you know, there's regularly front page headlines of, you know, two minibuses crash into each other and, you know, 20 people die. And uh, um, the, um, so this is a, you know, substantial social problem. Road accidents are actually a big cause of death among, among uh, adults, um, you know, prime age adults. Um, the, what they, their idea was that the passengers might not be actually, might not be too happy about the way the drivers are driving, but they don't, they feel bad about speaking up. So the idea was, well, maybe if you put a sticker inside the minibus, they're called matatos in Kenya, then maybe passengers will feel emboldened to speak up. Okay? That's, a, that's an example of why I think it's, by the way, why we adopted this approach of being open across sectors. Because you know, USAID overall made the entirely appropriate decision that they were going to focus on infant survival, child survival, and on maternal health. And that was a very reasonable decision 
for where to put their big funding. But at the same time, there might be some crazy ideas that are worth trying and only cost $200,000 to try, and why not, why not have some open window for that? And this, you're never going to get this idea coming out of, the, out of a, you know, a top-down planning system for health. Okay? These were you know, people, um, they, they, they proposed the idea. They did, they'd already done some work with, su suggesting it might work. They tried it out. They got data from the insurance companies on the rate of accidents. And, they, the, the, and the accidents went down 25%. So a dramatic impact. And obviously, it's a very cheap intervention. Since then, it's been scaled up to 40,000 minibuses. Here's partly what I mean by a combination of you know, private sector and public sector. The insurance company, the largest insurance company in Kenya, which has more than half the market, they decided that they were going to make this requirement for insurance coverage. So you have to have, to have, have this there. Two other insurance companies didn't do that, even though um, but the government then said, we're going to require at least that when you get your vehicles inspected each year, you have to have the, the sticker put there. So it's now in 40,000 minibuses. We have a assume a 30, we calculate a 35% share of the, uh, of the innovation costs, so we'll assign the, that share of benefits as well. That gives 5.8 million so far, up till now, in net benefits out of this uh, $215,000 investment. Okay. So obviously, this was on the right tail, but, um, but, um, but so that's one example. Another example um, is uh, also from Kenya, is our chlorine dispensers. So that's 5.4 million investment. Uh, there are a bunch of randomized trials in the health world on the impact of water treatment on diarrhea. So that, that number is fairly solid. You also have to make an assumption about how much does diarrheal mortality fall. We assume that the same percentage fall in diarrheal mortality as in diarrhea. That's an important assumption. But um, if you make that assumption, um, then you can get the, the reduction in infant mortality. There are 2 million users of this. It's scaled to that level. Um, the, you know, so, sorry, I should have explained the innovation more. There's water treatment solution uh, in this container. People collect water from wells, from springs. Um, you turn that tap, it releases uh, you know, the right amount of water treatment solution, a few drops, that's going to treat this 20 liter uh, container. Chlorine's super cheap, so this is it's, it's very, also very in inexpensive. Uh, about half the innovation uh, investment was financed by DIV. This has uh, generated $50 million in benefits. Okay, the third example uh, that we've got data on, also a health, um, is uh, affordable glasses. Uh, um, and this was a $430,000 investment by DIV. The, there's a, a randomized controlled trial where this was provided to tea pickers, and their productivity went up by 22%. Now, not everybody who got this was a tea picker. We're assuming that on average, the gains were half that. Um, and then the glasses last for three years. Again, there are some assumptions that go into this. Um, the, gain, the estimated gain there is $35 million. Okay. So if you take just these three innovations, and you just take the benefits up till 2018, the, the ratio of the benefits to the cost is 6.43. That's going to be a large under, underestimate, a substantial underestimate of the total benefits, because, of course, there's a bunch of other innovations, uh, including some that reach many more people. I'll discuss some of those in a minute. It'll also be an underestimate, because these are the benefits through 2018. Now, we don't know in the future. Maybe these programs will be sustained. Maybe they won't. Um, if we sustain just these three through 2023, five more years, at the same level they are now, so they didn't, they, assuming they don't grow at all, then the benefits would be more than 10 to 1. Okay. I'd like to now sort of discuss some of the other innovations, both to give a little bit of a flavor of why these are you know, really conservative estimates, but also to give some sense of how you might even think about which innovation scale. Okay, so the, 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 the innovation that was the tallest on that uh, chart before um, is that reached most people um, is software for mobile phones for community health workers. This is a, uh, a program that um, has been found to increase the number of visits that the community health workers do by 22%. It sort of helps them, it both helps, helps them do a better job, but it also helps motivate them and monitor them. And this is the government of India and the Gates Foundation are in the process of scaling this up to all 
one million plus community health workers in India. So right now, they're only partway through that process, but the number of uh, clients served by those community health workers is now 21 million. But this would move, obviously, hundreds of millions of people if India does indeed um, scale it up as they currently plan to. And we estimate, you know, if that does scale up to the level that the Indian government plans to do it, that would move the benefit cost ratio to 14 to 1. That's, you know, preliminary uh, analysis. Here's a, a, another program, that's, the second highest scaling program, was uh, voter report cards. So this was a project in, in, um, that in India. Um, the, um, there was a randomized controlled trial which tested the impact of providing, there's a lot of criminals get elected to uh, as politicians in India, you know, people with very serious cases against them. There's you know, lots of issues. They provided voter report cards with just basic facts on the, on the politicians. Um, and they found you know, pretty big impacts of it. There's an asterisk here because what was scaled up was a modified version of this, less intense, so we don't know if the effects are the same. But the original program uh, reduced vote buying, uh, which is uh, uh, um, uh, you know, endemic in India and many developing countries. We, no way to put a dollar value on that conceptually. So we're not including the benefits of that. The uh, election monitoring technology, a new approach to election monitoring, that was actually scaled up. So this was scaled up because an NGO um, developed the voter report cards, and the newspapers were very happy to publish them. If they get free content that the readers might be interested in, they publish them. So this was scaled up by the private sector, but not in the way, not in, the, in a traditional way that you might think of, or in a stereotypical way. The election monitoring technology was... Um, was actually scaled up by a political campaign. This was an approach to reduce voter fraud. And uh, the campaign of the, of the current president of Afghanistan uh, adopted this approach, and, uh, or a modified version of this approach. Um, the, um, but none of these three are included in our calculations. I put in, in red here the, one that, the ones that are. So we've talked about this already. Um, the roads you know, four, five, and six are already in the calculations. Seven was an approach to see are the, are the health workers actually in the, doing the, in the clinics where they're supposed to be by uh, monitoring their attendance. Number eight was an interesting one. Um, this is using, um, so a big problem in developing countries, it's very hard to give a credit rating to people because they don't have a credit history. So it's a chicken and egg problem, and there aren't formal records. So this idea was let's ask people questions and give them sort of a psychometric test and see if we can use, that can be predict uh, re repayment. Um, and the approach there is they are not scaling. They're not scaling by launching a new, a new firm or uh, well, they, they did launch a firm, but that firm doesn't directly go to customers. That firm works with banks, and a bunch of banks have adopted programs like this, and now. 1.4 million people have reached. And this could also substantially, if you think that there's a big gain to, to people getting access to these credit, um, then that could also substantially increase the numbers. But it's very hard to know. Uh, we don't include it because uh, as it's very hard to know how much that gain would be. Okay, just to give a little bit more. Um, um, you know, we also had some things that did get to a million, but are in hundreds of thousands, home solar systems, cook stoves, um, alternative approaches to recruiting community health workers. And then there were a bunch of things that basically went, you know, were well under things like uh, you know, a new, pro new type of bicycle tire that wasn't supposed to get punctures. Okay. Um, and a lot of them are much, you know, really never went anywhere. Okay. So what, what are the predictors of which ones scale? Okay. Um, so um, so, so the what we find actually challenges a lot of the conventional wisdom in the field. So in particular, we're, or we're, we're able to look at, is there a, is there a um, what's the effect of research on scaling? And there's often a view, I mean, I guess I'm biased here. I'm an academic, so you know, maybe it's not a surprise that I, I'm reaching this conclusion. But it's, a, it's actually what the data, I think, shows very strongly. The, we made, there were 43 total innovations, 25 of them involved had researcher involvement, uh, you know, development, uh, economics, and uh, researcher involvement in particular. Um, um, Seventeen of them didn't. They were, um, and there's a view that if you have, and that was very correlated with having a randomized controlled trial. There's a view that that just slows things down, prevents, uh, you know, uh, prevents lean innovation or something like that. 
and that that will be, you know, that in, you know, funding things like that might be a mistake. And what we found was, you know, very different. Of the, of the innovations that, um, I said 27, anyway, I got the number slightly off. But we, um, we um, there was a 30% of the ones that involved researchers, so still a minority, uh, reached over a million users. But none of the ones that didn't involve researchers uh, scaled. There's some subjectivity in this characterization, so maybe this should be seven and one rather than eight, eight and zero, because one of them researchers came in uh, later. Okay. What's going on here? That's hard to hard to know. It, is it the effect of the the rigorous measurement of evidence? Maybe it is, but maybe it's just the uh, the entrepreneurs who who knew they had something good were happy were open to uh, to rigorous assessment, and the other ones weren't. Maybe it's also that the researchers contributed in ways that weren't actually about the rigorous testing, but maybe it was in other ways. You know, if you're thinking about innovation in, the, in, in, uh, in technology uh, or in biotech, you, know, you wouldn't think it's strange to involve researchers because you want to involve leading edge ideas in the field, um, and that those can develop, you can develop productive products for that. I wouldn't have said that was true for development economists 30 years ago, but there's really been a huge change in the field, and a bunch of researchers, including you know, many in this room, are working on very practical problems, and, and, uh, but also applying you know, the latest findings in the field. So that, it's also possible that you know, that, that was a reason. Okay. Another view in the, in the f sort of that's very common among funders is that you know, pilots never scale. That there's no point making these small grants. So never, you know, you should really f focus on on larger grants. Here we got some very interesting findings. There's a certain sense in which our results were consistent with that. So we made 24 stage one grants, 16 stage two, three stage one. Okay. Yeah, the one stage one scaled, so over a million. So you know, smaller percentage of the stage two, still smaller percentage of the stage three. So that looks consistent with the conventional wisdom. But if you add one more element, you get a very different picture, which is let's divide by the total value of the awards. So you can make, you know, you can make a lot of stage one awards for, every, if, uh, for the same budget as a stage three award. Well, then you get this, these actually look, these numbers look you know, very, uh, you know, very, very low cost per person reached. And this is somewhat higher. Now, I think this was a very good program. We estimated a huge. You know, very positive, very, very positive benefit cost ratio. I wouldn't conclude these types of investments are not, you know, are not worth it. This is, this is one data point. I wouldn't, you know, um, I don't think we can generalize too much from it. But I think the conclusion, what is a valid conclusion is that these types of piloting investment, getting many shots on goal, uh, can, be, can be very valuable, even though most of them aren't going to succeed. Okay. Other scaling factors. Um, there's, you know, I would say one of the biggest findings, one of the biggest discrepancies between the vision that people have of how things scale and how they actually scale is many, many people in this sector think what I'm going to do is I'm going to develop a, a, a new, you know, a new, we'll have a new technology. We're going to sell that to individual customers one by one at the bottom of the pyramid, at the base of the pyramid, and that's how we're going to grow our organization. And most of the actual scaling was through adoption by existing large organizations. So in some cases, that was, that was government. So the, the difficulty with that, of course, is the customer acquisition costs are very high. And these are very poor people, and these are low-value items. And that makes that a, I don't want to say it's impossible. There are cases where it happens. But it's a very tough challenge to do that. If you're selling to a large organization that already has reach, either a government, as in the case of you know, the private company that was developing this community health worker software um, or and was selling to governments, or a business um, like the insurance company in Kenya, then you can, with, you can reach large numbers of people um, you know, much more, um, in a much, potentially in a much easier way. So that's what we found, that taking advantage of the existing ecosystem, not thinking of the organization in isolation, of the, you know, the grantee in isolation, but thinking about who can they work with to get this adopted? And then that has a, creates a very different uh, uh, sense of you know, management's important no matter what you do. But the management skills that you need to convince an insurance company, an existing insurance company, to adopt this might be very different 
than the management skills you need to you know, build an organization with hundreds or thousands of employees. Okay. Um, another key predictor was cost. Cheaper things were much more likely to scale. Here's another one which sounds obvious, but um, is not discussed very much, is country size. Um, I work on Africa a lot, but I, I have to admit that um, you know, the things, there's a much higher rate of scaling of things in India. It's much easier to get to over a million users if you're working in a large country. So it wasn't just, uh, you know, it, 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 if we look, yeah, when we do a statistical analysis, that's what we find. For profits versus nonprofits, we found a higher, you know, the ratio of number of things that scaled to the, um, to the number of awards was actually you know, somewhat better for the uh, nonprofits than for the for profits. I wouldn't make too much of that because the difference wasn't that big, and I don't think it's statistically significant. But for, that's what we found for what it's worth. Okay. Um, so, you know, to conclude, um, first the conclusions on the first topic what's the rate of return to innovation? You know, I start out saying there's a theoretical case for this, but you know, is, it, is it there? Well, this is just a case study of one funder. But when we look at the data from that one funder, and I, I, um, we've, it at least shows the potential of this approach, and particularly of this type of approach of open, tiered, evidence-oriented uh, uh, innovation funds to generate high returns. I think the bounding approach could be used to examine other, you know, por other portfolios, and I, I hope it will be. Um, the, but in our case, the benefits of these three innovations, you know, were sixfold the costs, and I think that's, um, and that's you know, probably a, 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 under, a, a pretty substantial underestimate. The key finding is this skewed distribution. And that has very strong methodological implications for how you look at this data. You can't say, you can't look at individual cases. You really need to take a portfolio approach. And you need to know that a lot of things are going to fail. And you can't even say, well, there was an 80% failure rate, and therefore this was a failure, because of this extreme skewness of the distribution. Um, it also means that you can't, for example, we've seen articles looking at the median return to innovation. That's gonna, the median was going to throw you way off. You really need to add up uh, across the whole portfolio. Okay. What are the conclusions on, on factors predicting scaling? Well, I you know, talked about them before. But some of the things that are thought to be detract from scaling by some, like piloting or testing or researcher involvement, we don't see any evidence that they detract. And in fact, you know, perhaps are, they're, they're, they seem very consistent with scaling. And having a broader approach to how you're going to scale and thinking not just about organic growth, but about uh, selling to large or adoption by large organizations, both large businesses and governments, seems, seems very important. So um, you know, I, think, I, I, I think that some of these lessons may be applicable beyond DIV. It'd be, Happy to talk about that, but let me let me actually truly conclude by saying we're accepting proposals. So we've you know some of the people in this room might be innovators. If you're an innovator, you know um, go to our website, uh, take a look, and see if you think it's a match. We're a government program, so I'm not you know, procurement rules mean I can't give you feedback afterwards about yeah you're you've got a good chance or not. But but read the rules and um, and if you think you're you're you know you're a good fit, please uh, please. Submit a proposal. Okay, thanks. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, thanks very much. That was a, a fascinating uh, presentation. I was just going to quickly say, I think this is hugely important. When I was working in the Treasury about 15 years ago, the thing I worked on was actually. Uh, how to assess how much money to spend on R&D tax credits. And the big driving question for this was, you know, cost versus benefits. And the UK, UK back then was spending a billion dollars a year. The US was spending about 10 billion. Across Europe, it's maybe 30 billion. But you know, that was the developed world where it was much right. easier to think about cost versus benefits. Right. So I was going to, uh, I had a bunch of questions. I'm just going to ask one, and then I'm going to throw it open because of time. But the one question to start off with was building on the comment you made about why you want to, uh, Incentivize innovation. So he went back to the work by Paul Roman. I should mention, you know, Ch Ch others have done work on economic growth. So uh, Pete Clano, Chad Jones, and others have work in this area. And in fact, there's like two offsetting forces. One of them you mentioned, which is um, when I innovate, my ideas spread out to others. And right. so 
for economists, you know, there's a, there's a positive externality right. in the market, and the free market doesn't innovate enough. Yeah. The other angle is what's often called business stealing, yes. which is um, it's typically thought of in pharmaceuticals. So mm -hmm. I'm a pharmaceutical drug. I see someone else is making a lot of money from their drug, and I want a piece of it, so I come up with my own drug. I make a lot of money, but the patient and the right. customers don't benefit. So it's often called crowding out, and yeah. I wondered... Um, Many of the, some of the innovations you mentioned, like the software uh, or the glasses, you could think of potentially private sector entrepreneurs may come in. And how you thought about running costings on that? Yeah, I think that's a great question um, and one that you know, I think we need to think about more. And it's hard to be um, hard to be completely objective about you know have a. But let me give you my subjective impressions on in this portfolio. So there were, uh, and I think um, so the. Three things that were included in the benefit cost analysis. One was the uh, stickers and the minibuses, uh, time, you know, encouraging the passengers to speak up. Um, one was the um, one was the uh, the water treatment dispensers, and the the third was the um, was the the cheap eyeglasses. So I think for the first two, I know those cases quite well, and I didn't, there wasn't an existing player at all there that was would potentially have been pushed out, and I think. I, a related question is, you know, would these have been adopted anyway? You know, if, if you know, um, I don't think those two would have. The eyeglasses, I know less about. My impression is it's not that much uh, crowding out, if you will, or business ceiling effect, because there were, there, there's just pretty low adoption in very poor countries uh, of this. I mean, but one where you, which you mentioned, where I think this is possibly a much larger issue, is the software for community health workers. You know, that is, that's actually not something that was existing, but I think it was an idea that a lot of people had. Right. And, you know, it may well be that had this company not done it, some other company would have done it. Or maybe it would have been two years later, maybe it would have been slightly better or slightly worse. So I do think for that one, that's not in our calculations right now. So but I think that one is a good example where... You know, you really have to think through those those issues that you're raising. But again, I pre I appreciate it was like fiendishly hard. It reminded me of my times at McKinsey trying to someone saying evaluate something that it's like impossible to do, and but you have to you have to do this to make decisions. Exactly. Um, yeah. And I, I guess I would also say just on this issue, if you're interested in the overall return to innovation, then to innovation spending, then you're still if you got this from a bunch of different funders, you're still imagine you got it for all the innovation funders. You would still conceptually be getting the overall return, even if some of the investment was sort of stealing from other innovators who would have done it otherwise. So that you know, that's partly why we did this at this share approach because that that uh, you can add up across uh, uh, innovation funders. Great. Okay. Uh, I have a yeah question at the back. So before you take your question, do you want to quickly say who you are and then uh, give us the question? Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Josh Solomon from the Department of Medicine. Uh, thanks very much for an interesting talk. Uh, I wanted to know a little bit more about the uh, pr proposal process, and um, specifically, is uh, part of that to ask applicants to try to e estimate what the expected scalability is and what the expected return on investment is. Uh, if you're not already doing that, wouldn't it make sense to do that so you can uh, have an opportunity to compare the ex ante estimate mm. of the ROI with the ex post evaluation of it. Right. And ideally over a medium or long term, learn something yeah. from that comparison so that you can do a better job at picking winners. Oh, that's, yeah. Do you want yeah, to do you want to, there's another question, related question, is it? Okay, yeah, what do we say, Josh? Okay, um, so we do, I, you know, this, uh, we do basically ask some, some idea about the potential for scale. Um, I don't think we were asking about projected benefit cost ratio, and it's a great idea. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll suggest it to the people at USAID and see what they uh, what they say from the next revision of the proposal. I will say that there's a somewhat of a cost of asking about this um, because some it's quite interesting. The the uh, sort of social entrepreneurs will happily give you numbers for things like that. Uh, the academic researchers, and you know, we got. You know, proposals from each are incredibly reluctant to give those numbers. They, they, um, I guess they're trained to, you know, be conservative in what they say. So, uh. okay, great. There's another question at the back. Jeremy Goldhopper Fiebert, also from uh, School of Medicine. Um, so, I'm curious about um, the benefit cost ratio as computed as a bound and what assumptions we need to make to think 
of it really as a lower bound, uh, motivated by sort of thinking about something like the Aswan Dam, which initially had these positive returns mm -hmm. and then over time had health yeah. implications yeah. and yeah. changed for um, agricultural yields in the, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, in the area that used to flood, for example. Right. Uh, um, so that's, that's something that's, you know, we're preparing a, you know, a, a more, um, you know, a version with more equations in it. And uh, um, the, uh, so, and more, you know, Greek letters. So that version lays out those assumptions. But basically, you need to assume that the costs beyond, that the programs didn't, did it, they didn't create costs beyond the cost that the most you could have lost is DIV's investment on when you aggregate against everything else. So if there was things that actually had negative effects on, uh, then that would, this would no longer be a lower bound. Or if in the future they're going to have negative effects. Now, um, I think, for, you know, I, I hope we didn't create, th find things with negative effects, but maybe we, you know, maybe we did it somewhere. But, um, but I think on average, it's pretty unlikely they had negative effects beyond, uh, beyond you know, the cost, us potentially wasting our money. Because the, you can think of many cases, take this, this uh, water, uh, you know, cleanliness. You know, it's possible that not only the individuals who, who, who took the um, water, you know, got, had clean water benefited, but maybe that it prevented f further spread of disease, of disease. So that would be an example of a positive effect that we wouldn't have in included. So anyway, that's the technical assumption that you need, which is you didn't create negative effects beyond possibly wasting the investment on, on average. Sandy, do you want to use the mic? Um, I just wanted to ask you about scaling, and you were talking about scaling in terms of numbers and breadth. Mm -hmm. uh, but what do you think about scaling in depth, um, and just more holistically, how it's impacting a community, um, essentially, and how, and if you're thinking about it, then how are you measuring or planning to measure the benefit of that, which would be more challenging, I guess. Yeah. Um, so we. In some cases, we could measure um, depth because it was a financial, you know, dollars or, or health, and we use dallies, which have problems, but they're, you know, they're, they're the best thing out there right now, I guess. Um, the, um, but there are other things where, you know, take these, these reducing vote buying. That might, it's quite, in fact, if I had to guess which innovation had the most impact, I would say it was some of these electoral reform uh, um, innovations. Because one of them, you know, and I don't, this might be a case where we don't know whether it was good or bad, but the, you know, the, the current president of Afghanistan used that, his campaign did this monitoring of the, of the votes at each individual polling station and sort of transmitting that back. And, you know, if that affected the election, then that would have had huge impacts, you know, for good or for bad, you know, it's very hard to say. So since it is very hard to measure in that, I, sorry, in that particular example, for good or bad, it's hard to say. Cleaner elections in general, if this gets adopted you know, by all the candidates or by the government, is probably a good thing. Uh -huh. But we can't measure that. So I would actually, I think it would actually be quite, in general, I love measurement. You know, I'm a social scientist. But I think that in the cases of things where we can't properly measure that, you don't, wouldn't want the measurement to distort decisions against some of these things that are, are, we don't have good metrics for. And so I would think I presented the benefits of the cost of three against the cost, sorry, benefits of three against the cost of the whole portfolio. I actually think a better way to do this would be to say, what could we conceptually get the, the measure the benefits for? And let's do the cost against the category that we can conceptually measure the benefits for um, and sort of acknowledge that there are other things that are just going to be very hard to get at and you know, judge, you know, and realize you'll have to make a subjective judgment whether to fund those. Um, and my question is about, um, so I appreciate your analysis of the predictors of scale, and I'm wondering if you've looked at the composition of the team, in particular the ratio of Westerners and non-locals yeah. to locals. Yeah. You might think that play pumps, for example, one of the reasons for its failure was because of who was not included on the team. Yeah, I, um, great question. We should, we should delve into that more, and we, we should have the data to, to do that, and um, it'll be very interesting to see the results. Question. Uh, 
bought into your portfolio, I'll call it. How many did you look at to get to the 41? Oh, great question. Uh, I don't, I, uh, Duke, who used to work there, is here. How many applications were we getting a year? That, that's a two and a half year period, yeah. yeah. So a, a huge number of applications and, you know, people like Duke were trying to look at the proposals and figure out which reviewers to send them to to make. I should say, of those proposals, 80% you know, of those, maybe more, you can tell very quickly in 10 minutes, it's not, it doesn't even comply at all. So this is, uh, this is, it's the, the one, the serious proposals, you know, a higher fraction of those got funded. Uh, but it was still, this was a very competitive program, very hard to get funded. I will just want to uh, uh, make one amendment uh, to your question. Um, the, so they weren't all businesses. Some of them were businesses. Some of them were, you know, we're going to develop a new system for recruit, for the government of Zambia to recruit community health workers. And that was a researcher uh, you know, who had strong ties with the Zambian government, and the Zambian government did adopt it. It didn't make our list of more than a million because Zambia is a pretty small country. So, but the Zambian government's now doing it, and, and the researchers working with other other countries which might adopt it. I guess I would just say, as a venture capitalist, mm -hmm. uh, there should be seed funds mm -hmm. that are looked at based on the product that value Yeah. Oh, I. I'm curious as to the methodology of large numbers getting to 41, and do you think it was done successfully? Did you pick the right ones? Let me tell. Uh, let me tell you one that uh, one. I'll tell you a mistake that was made. I hope that uh, I hope I'm not creating any problem here. Um, the um, so so um, we we definitely made mistakes. Um, the, the methodology, so a lot of them could be eliminated right off the bat because they were clearly terrible ideas. Or they were just, in, actually, I wouldn't even say that. They just didn't fit what we were about. They weren't innovations. It was somebody running an organization that had a school and they wanted to get computers for their school. And that might have been a great school and getting the computers for it. But there's, that's not an innovation, right? That's, uh, um, so, um, so what would you say, Duke? 80% or 90% could be rejected like that? OK. Then. The methodology for the, for, the, for the rest was one where we would take pretty seriously trying to get opinions from multiple people through this peer review process. And that's something that maybe we could do because we were government giving out grants and we cared about the social return. It might be hard for a venture capitalist to send it to a rival firm, but you know, we could send this out to both with, so we would typically send, if it was an agriculture proposal, we'd send it to the agriculture experts at USAID. We'd send it to the country office at USAID because maybe they're like, yeah, this is a good idea, but those guys are crooks. Everybody who works in Zambia knows those guys are crooks. Um, um, and then we would send it to outside reviewers. And those outside reviewers were sometimes venture capitalists, if it was a business, if it, and, and you know, we got a lot of venture capitalists who were extremely generous with their time, so we really appreciate that. And then sometimes we'd send it to academic reviewers as well, uh, and sometimes send it to both. And the academics were also quite generous with their time, but at least that's, that's sort of part of their job uh, to, uh, to do peer review. So. Okay. Pascal. <coughs> to follow up on that, I, I appreciate the finding that projects with researchers did much better. Sure. But um, I just wanted to ask the extent to which this may <coughs> come from the fact that the screening process was easier for your team when it was uh, they were, when there were academics on the team because you knew them or because there are there are metrics for evaluating you know how um, you know good or whatever the academics are. Whereas for a uh, proposal without an academic, you know, you don't have as much private information or it's much harder to mm. get objective measures. And so in some sense, maybe the, you know, there are similar distributions uh, in terms yeah. of success probabilities, but you just were better at picking the top, right. um, you know, the right tail for the academics and, and not for the others. I right. mean, obviously I would love it for my story yeah. not to be true. So yeah. that, you know, yeah. everybody is convinced to give us more money, but yeah. I just wanted to. <laughs> Look, I would not draw the conclusion. I, so I've tried to phrase things. Um, you know, I would not put things as, you know, you should fund academic researchers and not fund, you know, businesses. And by the way, you know, the community health worker, that's a business. That's a, you know, the, now they engage with academics to do 
you get research on the Vision Spring, those weren't, you know, the people leading that organization were not, uh, not researchers. So, um, so, but, so I would not draw the conclusion that the other f types of funding are a mistake. What I would draw the conclusion about is that researcher involvement is not sort of, or RCTs are not the sort of kiss of death that, uh, that some people um, you know, worry that they might be. Um, so those are consistent with scaling, but I, w I wouldn't draw the conclusion that the other things don't make sense. Um, um, so I was going to say about our mistakes, I realize I never actually said the mistake. Uh, so the mistake, I'm sure there are many of them. <laughs> But one mistake that's you know particularly uh, uh, so uh, um, now jet lag setting me the uh, the organization that gives cash uh, cash transfers that is give directly right. yeah. so give directly uh, applied and we th we thought you know cash to people is a great idea but there's no chance this is going to scale because nobody would ever fund that <laughs> they're clearly. Very wrong about that. So, uh, so that's uh, that's a uh, an example of a of a mistake. I'm sure we made many others. So, thank you for your honesty. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Why do we take one last question? Given it's six. Yeah. Such a, a general one. So, um, I have a question Lisa. Do you want to use the mic? Hello. So now I'm on the side applying for grants often, and mm -hmm. donors tend to ask about two things. One is sustainability. Mm -hmm. The other is cost effectiveness. Right. So I wanted just to hear, you know, DIV's approach to these two uh, buzzwords, I'll, I'll call them right, right now. Um, and also whether you think it's uh, the, the questions you ask should change depending on the country. Uh, you know, stable governments, post-conflict zones, mm. et cetera. So I think cost-effectiveness is, is, uh, is you know, quite key to getting this positive benefit-cost ratio, obviously. Um, and sustainability, so I would think of, I think, you know, if you want to get a positive benefit-cost ratio, you need large numbers of people adopting for a long time. So it needs to be uh, sustainable. Um, but I think we just need to broaden out our, our definition of sustainability. So some things are sustained through uh, commercial sales, which is a great way of a uh, uh, form of sustainability. Um, but some, are, but there's commercial sales to individuals, but there's also commercial sales to um, to other businesses. And you know, I think people in the venture capital, I'll defer to you, but you know, people in the venture capital industry know that there are a lot of good businesses out there that sell to other businesses. And that's a classic mistake many entrepreneurs make of not thinking about that. And then there's other there are companies that sell to, to governments as well. So just within the commercial area, think, you know, think broadly about who the customers are. And then, um, in, and we tried to do that, um, but I, to tell the truth, it wasn't until I analyzed the data that it really came home that, that uh, how many of the ones uh, sold to big businesses or sold to, uh, to governments. Um, and then there's also just sustainability through government or philanthropic funding. So you know, vaccinations are, you know, they're not, they're, they're definitely sustainable because they've been done at large scale for many, many years, but they're not commercially sustainable. Um, uh, I mean, in some categories of vaccines are, but you know, childhood vaccines for in poor countries uh, probably aren't. Uh, so broadened definition of sustainability is important. What's important in, in different countries, uh, you know, uh, different things will be realistic in different countries, but I don't have a general theory of that. It's a great pleasure to bring Michael here and have him tell us that if you're thinking about funding a big project involving researchers, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to thank our uh, speaker tonight, Michael, and uh, 